Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us today for this panel conversation on decolonizing data. My name is Nani Janse Revenlo. I'm the director of the Digital Freedom Fund, and I'm very happy to present to you Sarah Chander from EDRI, European Digital Rights, who will be moderating the conversation tonight. Sarah leads EDRI's policy work on AI and non-discrimination with respect to digital rights, and she is particularly interested in building thoughtful, resilient movements and looks to make links between the digital and other social justice movements. We are very happy to have been working with Sarah over the past year uh, on our work on decolonizing the digital rights field. I want to make sure that Sarah and the wonderful panelists that we have together here this evening have all the time they need for what promises to be a very interesting conversation. So I will hand it over to Sarah now. Thank you. Thank you very much and welcome everybody to this conversation on decolonizing data. Uh, as Nani mentioned, uh, this panel is organized as part of the Decolonizing Digital Rights Process, led by DFF and EDRI, my organization. Um, we are really excited to talk with you today about decolonizing data, but maybe a little bit before I jump in, just to thank uh, Nani and the team at DFF for organizing and hosting this conversation here today. Uh, the de decolonizing digital rights process um, for us has been a way to think about how the digital rights movement in Europe can be broader, more connected to global movements, but also to social and racial justice movements within. Uh, why we focus on Europe, um, we keep coming back to the question of what can we do in Europe, mainly because we know that Europe was very much the root of colonialism. And in many ways, the responsibility to deal with its impact is also here. So we hope this webinar can be one, hopefully of many uh, opportunities to look at digital rights from a decolonizing perspective. A little bit about our conversation today. Um, in the context of increasing digitalization and the rapid expansion of technology into pretty much all areas of our public and private lives, we are more and more aware of the impact of, uh, that this can have on people and communities. Increasingly, we are seeing that there is wider attention to the harms driven by technology. So whether it be in the context of state and corporate surveillance, the use of data-driven tools in punitive social welfare systems for the monitoring of workers and the use of AI and other technologies in migration control and at the border, we are constantly uncovering what is at risk when those with power deploy technology against us. Um, but we see lots of examples of growing resistance to these trends. Um, and this resistance is very powerful and absolutely vital. We're seeing the launch of major campaigns. We're seeing many, many legal challenges uh, uh, contesting some of these harms and we need to celebrate this. What though I think has been explored less, however, is the link between these harms and our broader histories and ongoing realities of racism, colonialism, extraction and domination. We've been consistently asking ourselves at uh, DFF and EDRI, what is the connection between the extraction of data from racialized communities here and broader tools of colonial uh, domination in the past and in the current day? Uh, we think that these reflections will definitely help us build a broader and even more powerful movement fighting for digital rights and social justice. So in today's panel, we really want to look at how data infrastructures centralize power, but also while dispossessing certain groups and communities. We'll also take a little bit of time to analyze this, but also, and I think most importantly, explore strategies for activists and organizations to contest and fight for the decolonized, decolonization of data and its broader infrastructures. So that's, I think, enough from me and about this panel, but I'm really excited uh, because I'm joined for this conversation by a really truly incredible lineup of speakers today, and I'll just uh, introduce them. So first things first, we have Evan Insir, uh, MEP. Evan is a member of the European Parliament since 2019 and is serving on the Committee of Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs, the Committee of Development and the Committee of Foreign Affairs. Uh, in addition to all of this, uh, Evan is, one, is part of the Parliament's uh, delegation to the EU-Turkey Joint Parliamentary Committee 
and the European Parliament's Rapporteur in charge of relations with Palestine, a member of the LGBTI intergroup and also co-president of the European Parliament Anti-Racism and Diversity Intergroup, or ARDI. Welcome, Evan. We also have Gracie Mae Bradley. So Gracie is a policy expert, writer and campaigner with expertise in civil liberties, state racism and surveillance. She was appointed interim director of Liberty in October 2020, and we're all very happy to see that. And she joined Liberty in 2017 as policy and campaigns officer leading work at the intersection of tech and human rights, but also has worked really broadly on many other human rights issues, um, such as policing, counter-terror and migration. Welcome, Gracie, happy to have you here. Next, we have Dr. Irene Fubara Manuel. Uh, Dr. Irene Fubara Manuel is a lecturer at the University of Sussex. Uh, they are a Brighton based media artist and academic working in animation, game design, and installation art. Their, roast, their most recent works include a really great, I can recommend, doctoral research project on biometric surveillance, because I have read it. Um, it. It's colonial histories and its contemporary uh, applications in migration control today. Welcome, Irene. And then last not least, uh, we have Yasleen Aslam. Yasin is currently the elected president for the App Drivers and Couriers Union and is involved with organizing drivers in 23 different countries in his role on the International Alliance of App-Based Transport Workers. Um, Yassine started uh, organizing drivers in 2014, which led to the first, first case in the UK against the gig economy in 2015 for workers' rights in the case of Aslam v Uber. And we know we're really excited to have you here today as well, Aslim, and we're really looking forward to hear about the case that's coming up on Friday. So welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, before we kick off, I just wanted to say that this webinar is being live streamed, but also recorded. So there'll be a chance to come back to it. Um, if something was said was very deep and you want to come back and reflect on it, you can do that. And you can also um, forward it on to those that you know that might have missed it. So with that, we will just get right into the conversation. Gracie, if you don't mind, I would love to start with you. Um, I have a question. Uh, you've done quite some organizing with Liberty and with Otherwise to highlight that data-driven tools are increasingly being used extensively in the UK and often that these tools have worsened highly racialized patterns and trends of surveillance and criminalization of certain communities. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I would, I'd love to. It's a great question. And it was, it was sadly quite hard winnowing it down to just a couple of examples to discuss. So I thought I would talk a little bit about Liberty's work on facial recognition, um, which my excellent colleagues have been leading. And I also thought I'd talk about data sharing for immigration enforcement purposes. Um, and I think the key place to start is that we can't abstract new technolo technologies from their social context, from existing state practice and from you know, power dynamics more broadly. Um, I think the tech advocacy at times has started with, there's a new technology, what will it do? And obviously new technologies have different rights implications on their own merits, and that's important, but I think we also have to look at the social context. So let's consider facial recognition. Facial recognition is a mass surveillance tool, and in the hands of the state, it marks a massive increase in, in state capacity to track us in real time. So to know where we go, who we're with, what we're up to. Um, and that has all kinds of rights implications for our right to protest, our right to privacy, our right to express our religion. Um, facial recognition also has specific ramifications for racialized people, as well as that general impact on rights. So Liberty brought a legal challenge against South Wales Police um, that secured a landmark judgment in August 2020. And the court in that case found, it's, the judgment is called Bridges, um, really amazing work by my colleagues in securing this. Um, the court found that South Wales Police had breached Article 8 of the European Convention on Human Rights, the right to privacy, the Data Protection Act 2018, 
and the public sector equality duty. Now, the public sector equality duty requires public bodies and other people carrying out public functions to have due regard to the need to eliminate discrimination. And the court said that South Wales Police basically had never tried to ascertain whether their software did or didn't have an unacceptable bias on the grounds of race or sex. Now, for a judgment, that, that, that's pretty significant. That's a pretty significant finding. Of course, what we know is that when it comes to discrimination and facial recognition, that's just part of the story, right? So we hear a lot about facial recognition systems being more likely to misrecognize women and black people, for example. We hear about discrimination in the tech. And that is of course a massive problem if it leads to someone facing a police intervention because they've been wrongly flagged as a match. That is a problem. But we also have to resist the urge to call for the tech to be better because we know what systems the technology is being and will be deployed to support. So if we look at what the Metropolitan Police in London have been doing, um, they did 10 trial deployments of facial recognition, 40% of which were, were in areas that had a high population that was people of colour or ethnic minority. So we know what the system of analogue policing and criminalisation look like. We know that those systems produce racist outcomes. So we know that black people are seven times more likely to be fined by police in England and Wales under the coronavirus rules. Um, we know from the Lamy review, which again looked at the criminal justice system in England, it found race disproportionality at every level of the criminal justice system. So when we talk about discriminatory facial recognition technology, we can't simply talk about discrimination in the technology because we have to look at the system in which that technology is being embedded. And we know that that's a system that is racist, right? So that was what I wanted to say about facial recognition. Um, if you want to do, um, do we we're running a position, um, resist facial recognition, that's uh, UK specific. Edria obviously doing amazing work at the EU level. So there's action that you can take there. I think it's reclaim your face, yeah. So that's um, facial recognition that I wanted to mention. But I also have spent a lot of time looking at government use of data for immigration enforcement purposes. Um, and what I'd say is that to date, UK government's practice in this area has been relatively crude, although it's had significant rights impacts. But I think it's a window into what immigration enforcement may look like in the future. And we already can see through that window what's going on at the external borders of the EU and so on. So. Immigration enforcement is, by definition, a set of practices that targets minoritized groups. Um, if you want to look at what this has looked like in the UK from 2016 to 2019, uh, there's a report on the Liberty website called Care Don't Share that sets a lot of this out in a lot of detail. Um, essentially, what the UK government had been doing was using a relatively crude matching algorithm to match data collected by essential public services against lists of people believed to be in the UK unlawfully. And so where there was a match, the Home Office would be given that person's address or other up-to-date contact details, and they would then be able to do immigration enforcement against them. So potentially that might have been sending a letter, but that also might have been, you know, stronger enforcement action. It could have led to detention, it could have led to deportation. Um, and this was the data of thousands of people and it was data that was initially collected by health services, by schools, by welfare benefits providers. And those frontline workers, when they collected that data, had no idea that it could be used for immigration enforcement purposes in this way, because it was all the, the data sharing was secret and it was taking place at a cross departmental level uh, in government. So this essentially meant that people couldn't safely access public services, even if they were technically entitled to. And that, of course, had really severe implications for people's rights. It also means that the government has been able to refine a data matching architecture that could be used against other people for other purposes. You know, this is the government refining its ability to shut people out of public services, essentially at the click of a button. 
And if we look to the US, we see that data mining companies like Palantir have played an integral part in immigration enforcement practices that have violated people's rights. And that's the same Palantir that has a big contract for running data analytics for the UK government's pandemic response in the NHS. So those were two case studies that I just wanted to talk through. I mean, as I say, we've had this amazing, amazing judgment in, in respect to facial recognition and in respect of data sharing for immigration enforcement purposes, A, we've been able to expose the agreements and B, we've been able to legally challenge them. And in the in respect of health in particular, there was there's at least one data sharing agreement that we've been able to get scrapped. Um, so it's attritional, um, but we can succeed. But what we see essentially is that new technologies, you know, we can't abstract them from what the state already wants to get up to um, because we know that they will be used to target people who are already marginalized and to further agendas that limit the rights of people who are already pushed to the margins. So I'll leave it there, Sarah. Thank you so much, Gracie. I think that this is always a really important to reminder that often a lot of these things are not new, particularly when we're talking about surveillance in general and there's been a really long history of surveillance that we need to not forget when we're talking about the new technology aspect of it um, but also thank you for reminding us that how this point about how tech can also be and, and also these data data practices can also be transplanted from one sector to the other and that we need to be aware of that um, which brings me to our next speaker Yasin. Um, in the context of sort of worker surveillance and organizing, you've been really at the forefront of that work at the international level um, and sort of been organizing workers to contest the management practices and surveillance of app drivers. Could you tell us a little bit about what are some of the main issues for workers there? Yeah, hi everyone. Um, yeah, I just want to follow on from what Gracie said. Um, she talked to the I mean, especially the work with Liberty done. So I'm not going to, uh, like uh, Sarah introduced myself, I have been working with drivers from around the world, but I'm just going to take uh, focus on London here, just to give you a glance. So in London, we have one over 110,000 private hire drivers, and we have 25,000 taxi drivers. Now, the 110,000 private hire drivers, 94% of them are from BME community, and the 25%, I mean, the 25,000 Taxi drivers, they 84% of them come from uh, a white British background. Yeah. So all these drivers, they have, in order to get a license, they need to do a DBS and enhance the criminal check. Now, um, the problem we're having is uh, when, especially when Uber had their license refu uh, refused uh, at Magistrate Court, the police actually intervened saying that they want Uber to get their license so they could use the platform to surveil for surveillance to monitor the drivers. Now, you know, and I just want to be very clear, we're not anti-technology, so we're not there to shut down Uber. Uh, we do believe that um, technology should be good. But what um, uh, Gracie just spoke about, like the discrimination element, and it's affecting the BME side. So for example, on a day to day, we get drivers getting assaulted. Uh, so if they've been monitored, uh, there's a surveillance system, uh, let's say a driver gets assaulted, it could take up to 10 weeks just to identify who the customer is, you know? Um, and then at the same time, when we talk about companies like Uber, the way um, they performance manage workers, the way uh, they were forced to bring in a facial recognition system, which was pushed by the regulator, uh, TFO. Um, unfortunately, the problem we're having is there is a massive institutional uh, problem by the regulator transport for London. And at the same time, um, you know, it's the BME workers that are at the harsh end of this. So I'll just give you an example. Like last year, we were doing demos um, against the congestion charge. Um, so we were in Parliament Square. And we had the taxis doing their demos first, and then we were doing our demos like half an hour afterwards. So every time we turn up to do our demos, um, the Met Police, they were, they were heavy handed. They wouldn't let us in. We get drivers getting pushed about. Um, James Farrow actually got arrested and put on trial for assaulting two police officers. So they set him up in such a way. And you could see like the racism side that's happening. And what we established from this case when we done FOI is that 
the, um, the cab enforcement unit was actually, um, which is funded by TFL, the regulators. So 95% of their budget come from TFL. They were just monitoring us. They were watching our social media accounts, um, you know, like they're inquiring about what meetings we were having with TFL. So, um, you know, and, and the problem we now have is once this is like information this, which is available to us, what about information that they don't? So Uber now introduced this facial recognition system. Yeah. And what we're seeing is people of color are failing those checks. So it's not just about failing out Uber. They then get reported to the regulator, TFL, and they end up losing their license. So they then having to explain themselves to uh, TFL on why um, they failed. And, you know, like it's like and even like the dispatch system, like how these jobs work, who gets to work, how they get these jobs. We see a lot of drivers getting deactivated for fraud. Yeah. And when we start looking into that, we realize they haven't committed no fraud. The only thing they were actually doing was canceling jobs. Yeah. So because you're canceling job, they set up, uh, well, they program the system in such a way, which we call algorithm, is um, it's just to performance manage them. But there's no transparency. So there's no way we could object. There's no way we could do that. Yeah. Um, you know, at the same time, it's like we had an article come out on BFC News today um, about the condition at Heathrow Airport. Um, you know, like we got a lot of Muslim drivers. Um, they don't have a place to pray at. And the reason for that is there's a geolocation and that's where they have to be based on. So they sort of like programmed in a way to stay at a certain area and they could be there for five hours and they pay to be there. But, you know, they don't have the adequate facilities, you know, that they need basic facilities such as praying, hot water, um and stuff like that so what we see is people sort of do resist to that and you um especially when tfl um revoked uber's license we had about four or five drivers were that were playing around with the gps yeah but i understand why people do it because the conditions are so bad and they're hidden behind technology but we can't object to that you know um so the problem we have from our side as a union, uh, what we're seeing is these technologies, they're failing and they're causing harm to workers and workers that they themselves don't understand the technology or the algorithm and the stuff behind it, such as facial recognition, uh, how the work is dispatched and all that kind of stuff. Thank you, Yasin. Every, every time I, I hear from you, I always it always really makes me think that like, there's been so much great work and organizing done to sort of get more sort of control and, and, and have more transparency of the data. Then we also see more and more examples of questioning that like the data and who it actually serves. So like many of your cases have, have shown that actually the data is there. And when, for example, people like the Met want to use it, the data is there. But then when it's the case of workers wanting to question what is being done with the data and how that then it's another story and actually it's a it's a close is that's a closed story that we that the workers can't access I, I, that that parallel always always really hits me every time you speak thank you for sharing that um Evan, I would really like to come to you now. Um, you work at the Civil Liberties Committee and so have a really strong oversight of different fundamental rights and discrimination issues more generally. Um, how is it from your perspective, um, how do you see some of the main issues with data-driven technologies and how they concentrate power? Thank you very much for inviting me to uh, this discussion. And uh, I'm listening very carefully, especially due to that it is... Uh, as you rightly said, an issue that is on the agenda of the LIBE, uh, the Committee of uh, Civil Liberties, Justice and Home Affairs. And it is actually a very hot topic right now on how do we make sure to, uh, to uh, on one hand, um, um, keep our um, uh, the right to uh, the freedom of speech, for example, uh, for example on uh, social medias at the same time as 
we are able to address illegal content at the same time as we should. I mean, one of the very important things that was now said um, uh, just a couple of uh, minutes ago on the issue of transparency, I think it's very, very crucial, and not at least when in, connect in connection to the, uh, the issue of algorithm. So it's quite a lot of things that uh, we are right now discussing. But I would actually want to first start up with uh, um, on a positive note, where that the, the, the digital age that we are in right now have actually led to a lot of innovation. It has led to a lot of opportunity and a lot of connectivity in a way that we it was not possible before. We, uh, for example, are able to um, uh, connect with people in the other part of the world uh, in a total, uh, much easier way than before. And we get information on what is happening on other parts of the world much easier than, than, um, than we were able to. However, as you also rightly pointed out, we know that challenges in real life with the colonial thinking uh, and uh, racist, um, structural racism that we very, very well know uh, exists, not at least has it also been a very um, high uh, on or very up on the agenda of the parliament and the committee of the, the Libe committee um, during the last year. Uh, and I hope that the discussions will not just um, fade away uh, after the discussion we had during the summer, um, but it will continue. And this conversation leads to continuing pushing uh, as decision makers, and especially those decision makers that do not really want to talk about anti-racism and colonial thinking, both in real life and um, uh, on online platforms, that those com these conversations really um, push these uh, conversations um, uh, to, to be high on the agenda of the parliament. With this said, it has also already also been mentioned that, for example, the police um, concentrate their, their efforts, for example, to marginalize neighborhood, uh, targeting black and brown people, and they all uh, and that any technology used have the risk uh, of um, exacerbating um, existing issues. Uh, and uh, as I said, I mean, it's going. We are taking it. What has happened is that it's gone from uh, real life, um, the physical life, into online platforms. One example that I have understood um, uh, was, uh, or that I would I would actually like to highlight is uh, an issue. Uh, that appeared in uh, in uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, I have understood that this was used. Uh, this um, system was used in a famous case, uh, the Dutch government that deployed a system to detect uh, fraudulent behavior in benefits, creating risks pr uh, profiles of individuals, and that 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 the Dutch court found that this system actually violated human rights and privacy law, and that it was primarily deployed in poor and migrant neighborhoods also lead to, of course, uh, discrimination. And unfortunately, it is not, uh, um, it is not uh, by, um, by nature a law that uh, many of the poor areas uh, around Europe uh, contains of people of color. We know that there is a very uh, severe and uh, severe um, and a discrimination um, um, approach to it. Um, but with, uh, and we therefore also know that structural racism exists everywhere, both in real life and online, in all countries and in all continents. Racism, misogynious and homo homophobia does not cease to exist only uh, online uh, or in the digital world, but actually everywhere. Each technology advancement has brought about revolutionary developments, but also challenges. Digitalization and data-driven technology brings many benefits, as I said, but also many risks. Um, the issue of technology related to privacy, data protection, and upholding other fundamental rights is more, I would say, important now than ever. I was in a, you have maybe heard about um, Clubhouse, this new conversation platform. So I took part in one of the conversations there um, about uh, this topic that, I mean, could we just le let the situation as it is just continue or do we actually need to make sure to address this, um, this current situation? And, and I do think that if we do not address hate, um, uh, racism, um, homophobia and so on, uh, now we will just see it escalating on the uh, online platforms, but with, it will also be, be used by both states, but also even more 
private companies um, to, um, to try to get money out of it. And sometimes profiting out of something doesn't always mean that it would be best for the people. It could uh, lead to cementing um, racism and even making it even more institutionalized than if it is possible to make it more institutionalized than today, because I think already today, both online and in real life, we see a severe institutionalized racism uh, all over the world. So it is, um, we, it is a very, I mean, on the high, on the top of the agenda of the, the parliament. Uh, and I think that we really need to uh, look into it. And we also need to make sure to, uh, to address it and not let it go as, uh, as if it's something that will solve it, be solved by itself. Uh, a lot of different examples has already been mentioned on how data has been misused and how it has actually um, hit uh, vulnerable groups of pe black and brown people and people of color in a much bigger extent than it does uh, uh, other groups. Um, so it is uh, in, uh, in, in all our interests to make sure that we not only talk about the Europe for all, um, but we also act on a Europe uh, that is open for all and that, um, that take the struggle for all its citizens, regardless of if it is online uh, or offline, or if we, are people, we belong to people of color or other groups in the society. So with this said, it is a very hot topic and, and a very high level uh, of the agenda. But I also want to finally add that uh, we are not, there is no consensus on this topic among all the parliamentarians, especially with the far right movements growing this during this mandate. Uh, we see that um, some of the issues this mandate is even more challenging to address um, more than it has been during uh, other mandates. Um, and uh, finally then, um, with the uprise of uh, not at least the, the, um, the uh, movement, the BLM movement uh, during last year, it actually led to, I would say, some decision maker that I would never th have thought would agree on um, voting in favor of policies um, actually did that after a lot of pressure from civil society. So uh, finally, what I want to say is continue this very important work because um, we who uh, in the parliament who are every day taking the struggle for, um, for uh, the anti-racism struggle and uh, see what is happening with the colonial thinking and racism um, uh, systems being moved from real life into uh, the parliament, we also get uh, a lot of strength for, uh, from, uh, from uh, the civil society movements and we are also in that way able to easier push those forces who do not see the same structures that we do. Thank you so much Evan and I think you really did a good job to show this sort of range of extent of issues that can be brought to the to the table when we're talking about how far sort of digital technologies data-driven tools can impact the question of racism not just in the areas of um, policing and migration control although this is a huge area um, but also yeah the delivery of social services and social benefits definitely with the Siri case and also more recently with the collapse of the Dutch government um, which was in, in very many ways related to uh, algorithmic management. And we saw how it impacted disproportionately people of color. I thought that was a really great um, example to give and how this is also in the wider Europe as well as issues related to the UK, as we've heard. Um, with that, I, I, know, I know Evan, you, you, you pointed to some solutions and I would lo really love to come back to that. But before we do, I would like to ask Irene. So Irene, many of the questions that we've been talking about and the case studies we've been talking about uh, draw on biometrics, um, even if not only their biometrics, uh, they, they look in some ways at biometric data. And I know that you've really studied in great depth um, the colonial development of biometric data collection. I wondered if you could talk about this and tell us um, how you think it's relevant to today's migration system applications. Um, so my work, I would say, looks at legacy databases to some extent, starting off with the first 
the sort of conceptualization or the, the creation of what we now understand as uh, the modern day finger, fingerprinting system, right? So how I looked at it is pretty much looking at the history of the fingerprinting system from um, India, pretty much um, the, the work of, what's his name, Herschel, all the you know British administrators that were in Nepal. And there was one particular um, name that came across, um, Rajadai Konai, whose work, whose hand actually, whose handprint was taken by um, William Herschel. I, I might be getting the name wrong there. And he took his handprint uh, as a form of um, like signature to sort of uh, keep the person bound to his word, to keep Rajadai Konai bound to his word so that he would be able to complete a road contract. And in, when you look at what Herschel writes about, you could see that he took that fingerprint or that palm print in order to frighten the man from ever, um, you know, running away or from ever, um, you know, not completing his work. So within that context, I, I see colonial, that's pretty much how I see um, modern day biometric data collection, in, especially in migration. It is to some extent a, a system of fear. Right, you give your data, understanding very much that that um, data you have given is the, to some extent, essential truth of your identity that you cannot challenge. And if you are, if that truth that is in that database does not match with your body, which is your fingerprint that you are presenting, then you become, you know, a criminal. Then you become someone whose uh, identity, to some extent, is false. Right, so. Taking that uh, concept of the creation of data uh, of um, of the fingerprinting system in colonial India, moving on into the ways that, for instance, before um, the um, passbook system in South Africa, there were also databases to some extent, analog databases of fingerprints as well. They were used to collect and um, connect people to their different, you know, ethnic identities. Um, so that system developed again, changed into the passbook system and now develops even further in South Africa into the HANIS system, which is currently being used. Same thing with the um, system too that, that is now used, the universal identification system that is now used in um, India. Um, so in, in essence, what the colonial process of reduction of people's identity, the collection, the collation of people's identities does is that it creates a legacy database that later on can be then, you know, re reimagined, retransformed into um, what, what we use now for our different databases. So to some extent, there is no way that you can sort of say that, um, you know, these data doesn't necessarily fall out of the air. There, there are ways that they are sort of changed. There are ways that they are transformed over and over again. So that's looking at the colonial aspect of it in terms of the 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 um, creation of the biometric technologies, and also um, looking at the work of I think is Fred Francis Galton as well, who um, again moved from the. William Herschel's handprinting system into the actual finger fingerprinting system. And essentially what he was trying to do with the technology was to create a truth about race as well, right? So when you look at what he's writing about, pretty much he is one of the major, I would say key thinkers in eugenics, right? So there's no way you can take the idea of biometrics without taking into, con into consideration the ways that biometric technologies have come from these colonial, these racist um, sort of uh, roots, right? So moving on from there, focusing more into the UK system, what I became interested in, I think this sort of relates back to um, what Gracie has said um, on the facial recognition system in the UK. Um, so in the 1940s, there was, um, uh, there was a sort of, there are laws, not even in the 1940s, closer to the 60s and 70s, there are laws when there was this um, migration of Caribbean and African people into the UK. Uh, they pretty much started reading, the home office started reading the data and realized that 
not even realize they were rejecting more more black and brown people and then they finally said oh because we are rejecting more black and brown people we need to put in these visa requirements because they are criminals and again this is sort of like now in this i think within the last year um the judge council for the welfare of immigrants and folks glove came together to address the machine learning algorithm that pretty much is <laughs> is a reimagination or a reinterpretation of this 1940s you know thinking which if you should read through the parliamentary procedures and the hansards you see that exactly that this exactly is what they're saying because a certain percentage of migrants were rejected they were then criminalized and their criminalization was used as a basis to police and enforce um you know more migration uh, border border policing on on the on these communities so to a larger there's it's it's always yeah i would say in in essence what i've sort of come to the conclusion to is again similar to what gracie says that these um, systems, these colonial systems, these um, technologies, it's not necessarily useful to constantly develop and advance these technologies without sort of going again and asking yourself what were their original uses, what were the original contexts in which they were developed, and how are they different? So when we look at it, when we look at it as a larger, you know, looking at the bigger picture, we see that since the 1800s or since the late 1800s if i'm sure again they've been used to demarcate people based on their race they've been used to um you know classify people and um sort of for white supremacist ideologies to, to a larger extent so yeah that's that's pretty much my entire <laughs> dissertation <laughs> in a in a snapshot for you Thank you so much. I think you saved a lot of people some time by summarizing it. I'm really happy that you did that. Um, thank you. I, I, I think that you, you make some really good points about the putting things back in the context that we talk about them. And I, I think we're hearing more and more about the link between data-driven tools and racism. Um, but much of that conversation is really in the current day, which is important. And it's important to think about that. Um, but more broadly, how do, how does this fit in into history and the similarities, I think, that you've drawn out with your examples with all of the case studies that Evan, uh, Gracie and Yassine have pulled out, I think is like really in, important not to forget um, those links and those links to colonial control as well. Um, I would really like to use the remaining bit of time that we have to talk a little bit about what are the strategies for resistance that exist that we know about and also maybe that we don't know about yet? Um, Yasin, I'd love to come back to you to talk about the ongoing fight to contest some of the things that you've already talked about, the algorithmic management and surveillance of workers. Yeah. Um, I would really like to know like, what is going on to contest and what would a win look like for you? Yeah. Yeah, and the thing, I think Irene actually hit the nail on the head because, um, like I said, um, and what I talked about earlier on, because we represent BME workers, and it's like it is institutional racism because you've got a certain workforce that is being, you know, labelled as criminal, yeah? And this is why it's important to do what we're doing and fight it head on. Um and I think like um, in terms of like, I, I believe, and this is based on my experience, because I started a case back in 2015 for the workers' right. Yeah. And we're waiting for an outcome, which is on Friday, but it took six years for us to get from A to B. But my point is, look, these laws exist. So we don't need any new laws. We already got laws. What we're seeing or what I find is we got regulators or someone or whoever is responsible for enforcing these laws are failing. And what they're doing is they're allowing companies like Uber or whether it's Met Police or whoever to um, not obey the law. And especially in case of Uber, they could afford to not obey the law and get away with it. So, you know, like for us guys, what we're trying to do as um, a union and we're different compared to other unions where in our rule book, we're focused on the digital right. And the reason for that is 
we want to establish like who's getting the work, what's happening. So we got transparency. And what we want to see in the long term is some kind of collective bargaining agreement that includes data. So we could sit on the table with our employers or operators or whoever they are and, you know, bargain in, in the interest of workers rather than having to go through lengthy court battles. Yeah. So, you know, and this is like in terms of like the gig workers and it's not just isolated to Uber drivers. This applies to Deliveroo or fast food drivers, because if you look at Uber's model, they rely on these precarious BME workers because they're the workers they could exploit and they're the people that won't resist. So generally speaking, as Uber gets bigger and bigger, and they recently brought out uh, AutoCab. So AutoCab is the back end of the dispatch system for the taxi and the private hire. So they own both end of that data, uh, you know, like our pictures, our algorithm, everything. So the way I see it as a worker, I should feel safe and protected. And that's not happening. You know, it's the opposite. That data has been manipulated just to watch us. And just going back on to the point Avin talked about, um, you know, about how migrant workers are treated as like, are they doing benefit fraud? We had similar issues with our regulator here in London, Transport for London, where they tried to push, um, uh, well, they wanted us to provide our national insurance number so they could check and see if we're doing benefit fraud. So they want all this data. But what they failed to do or didn't want to do is see if these drivers are making the minimum wage, you know, so they got access to it. So this is where, you know, collective bargaining, making sure that uh, as a union, you know, uh, we could get access to this so we could campaign by so we could balance the power. Because at the moment, the balance shift over, um, you know, where if you got money, you could fight it. So from my side, the way I see it, it shouldn't be the workers doing all the heavy lifting. And that's the case at the moment. So, for example, in my case, I had to go through a lengthy uh, court process. So there's emotional impact on the workers itself. So, for example, like um, when we started the case against Uber, Travis Kalanick was uh, one of the founder, um, you know, like we see in different managers. So he actually cashed out and moved on in his life. But there's me stuck there fighting a case, you know, um, and, and it's the same with the digital right. You know, like we do need people of influence, people out there to help us, support us. So it's not just the workers fighting. I mean, we could do what we can from our side and, you know, uh, lead these movements and unions and fight for the digital right. But people with influence needs to be fighting these regulators or making sure, you know, um, you know, there is some enforcement and that's what's failing to happen. So we got the same kind of thing with ICO, you know. Um, so, so like, our, like what we're doing as a union is trying to build a data trust, and uh, so, so we, the workers themselves, are empowered. They have their own data; they control that data, and we could use that data as a union for collective bargaining. I hope I covered. Everything. You did. Thanks so much. And the point that you made about the precarity creating the conditions basically for extraction of data for profit of certain individuals and groups, I think is a really important one that we often forget. Um, it also reminds me of the data extraction of migrants at the border as well. Like what we're, do we're doing is capitalizing on a already precarious population or, or people in a vulnerable position for best way to extract data from them. And I think this is something that we often forget when it comes to big tech or the use of data from by the state is that often they're capitalizing on existing vulnerabilities. Um, Evan, I would love to come back to you. You already started to talk a little bit about what can be done about this. I would love to go back to this. And I wondered if there is something that you thought um, in the context of your work in the EU um, could be done to tackle some of these things, particularly considering that it's gonna be such a big year for digital legislation coming up. First of all, I think that having in mind the um, racism and the discrimination that exists, one of the most important thing is L trying to look over also um, those regulations that we have in, pl in place, do they also, are they also, do they also apply on uh, when it comes to um, 
the uh, the um, uh, s social medias and when it comes to uh, um, the new area of uh, uh, of uh, the digital area and more than that also how do we make sure to enforce um, uh, those regulations that we have in real life but also on on uh, uh, in the digital space second is when it comes to collection on of information i think i mean we need to be very 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 careful uh, the the main thing here is the uh, the protection of personal data is a fundamental right. It's even regulated in the Charter of Fundamental Rights of uh, the EU. Um, so that needs to be very high um, on on the, the uh, uh, very high up. And on those cases where there is a collection of data, we need to ask ourselves: Is it necessary? Um, uh, is and is there a scrutiny con connected to it? Is it possible to contest it? Are there safeguards in place? Uh, and unfortunately, too often when these issues are being discussed, uh, the other side is not being discussed with a contest. Uh, contest um, with if it's necessary, do we have scrutiny and do we have um, um, uh, uh, safeguards in place? So I think those things are uh, very much important, especially now when we are discussing not at, at least um, uh, this, uh, the Digital Service, uh, Service Act. Uh, and the e-privacy and uh, so on. Um, so I would say, yeah, these two on on um, on looking over the discrimination laws uh, that or anti-discrimination laws that we have in place, and also in connect a connection to them, the things that I just um, I I just mentioned. Um, uh, without that, I really do believe that we are on a very um, uh, problematic path if we don't uh, address them now. We already see uh, on uh, on social media not at least and now i'm taking that as an example how much hatred how much um, uh, racism and, uh, and uh, th that exists on them so we need to find different ways of trying to um, address this and when it comes to uh, something that i said before and has been repeated several times but by, by the other speakers also is the issue of transparency uh, in connection to algorithms for example or transparency in connection to uh, data collections uh, um, uh, i myself uh, worked now on um, a report on um, uh, in co connection to uh, not at least transparency um, uh, in the EU institutions and the access to um, information or public public access to uh, documents in the EU institutions. Yeah, even there, I I saw the importance of uh, transparency and with transparency in mind, one will be able to see how are the different um, different regulations or systems hitting uh, different groups. Not that we maybe need to, uh, or we already now know uh, how it is, but that would make it even more evident. And we will also be able to prohibit a negative, the negative consequences in an earlier stage than today. Thank you, Evan. I think I would also add that the upcoming artificial intelligence legislation might be a way Absolutely. to address some of these things. But I, I yes. completely take your point that if we, if the point that you made earlier is that we have a huge challenge of political, um, like a lack of political consensus about how best to regulate on many of these issues, particularly if we have um, a far right or a right wing dominance in the parliament, how do we push through very progressive uh, legislation which is designed to protect workers' rights, which is designed to protect um, people against discrimination? I think all of these things are still questions up in the air. Um, going back to Gracie and to Irene, I have a broader question for you both which is that, so, so we've talked a little bit about the difficulty of enforcing um, existing legal frameworks. We've talked, and, and Yassine's put beautifully that often the burden of dealing with many of these harms is in the current system is put on the individual um, or on collectives of workers. So some of the people that you could argue are probably some of the most impacted or potentially in, in a less of a situation to be able to contest some of these things. The current system requires um, those groups, those people to be the ones contesting. And that's obviously not ideal and not necessarily best conducive for justice. Um, 
it's a big question for such a few just a few minutes but I, I have noticed and I think it would be really interesting to explore that there's an increased application of principles of um, abolitionism to the, the, the conversation about tech namely this idea that actually what we need to be doing is dismantling and moving away from the expansion of resources for things like the surveillance state, for the criminalization of people, and trying to put those resources to other, other places, other things that are best um, designed for care and solidarity. And I wondered if you think that this is a good way, route to go down and what do you think about the application of abolition to the tech argument um it's a huge question and we only have a few minutes worth left time so i don't know if irene or gracie you want to go there's time for yeah. you both though okay yeah um I think it's a great question and also just you know if you'd said to me when I started working in human rights that like maybe I'd get to do some discussion with predominantly people of colour about abolition and how it applies to things that generate human rights violations I would have been like yeah yeah fine in like 40 years time and yeah here we are um so that's that's really nice um I think that abolition, first of all, it recognises that many of the solutions that we often deploy to resolve social problems don't actually change the conditions in which those social problems occur and aren't necessarily effective in dealing with those social problems, as well as maybe being harmful. Um, and I understand abolition to be concerned not simply with reacting to harm, um, but as I say, kind of transforming the conditions in which harm occurs and rather than sort of just getting rid of stuff if we think about how Angela Davis talks about prisons it's about making them obsolete so I know that Safia Noble and others have sort of raised this question when it comes to tech and I think this is a really useful and challenging question for human rights organizations and I think it pushes us to think you know what would need to happen for surveillance tech to be obsolete like that's just a really really right <laughs> Um, but I feel like the current political moment is really uh, weighted towards um, us not sort of imagining things like this. Um, so, yeah, this is just something I was thinking about earlier. But I think it's a useful frame because too often debates about tech proceed on the assumption and especially, I mean, punitive carceral technologies. Often we proceed on the basis that it's going to be used maybe we should debate a bit after it started to be used, um, whether or not it should be used, at which point it's kind of late. Maybe we can think about how we'll constrain the worst excesses of use. Maybe we'll try and mitigate some of the harm that it causes. Maybe we'll just try and make sure it's used on the right people, um, a category that we know expands year on year. And while I think a human rights analysis is really good at demanding that we look at, is there an adequate legal regime? Is this thing even effective? is it proportionate? Um, we often do find it difficult to get out of the mode of how do we just constrain this thing? And I think abolition is really challenging, but it really pushes us to widen the frame of the debate and to look for transformative solutions that would get to the root, um, to look at what non-punitive policy solutions might be on the table when often we end up laser focused on when can we use facial recognition, not what else might solve the problems that facial recognition claims to solve without any of the rights harms. I think abolition really widens the frame. Um, so yeah, I think it's useful, as I say, for human rights organizations, I think it's really new and challenging, um, but it's very generative. Thank you so um, much, Irene. Yeah, for me, yeah, it's, 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 it is the same thing. It is, at least thinking of migration. I think recently um, for one of my research projects, I just reached out to a, an organization here in Brighton and I, I, I just asked the question and I got a very simple answer because <laughs> I was like, I was pitching an idea that I wanted to do my research with them talking about the future of, you know, machine learning and so on in biometrics. And the, the answer that just came back to me was like, first of all, ban the visa requirements. So, and I was like, yeah, <laughs> it's, <laughs> the thing that I've come to realize with a lot of the, there is no scarcity of imagination. There is, <laughs> it's people, if when you read, I, I've been following up with Liberty as well, by the way, Gracie. Um, <laughs> 
when you read the the white papers, whatever it is, I don't know what policy people call it, but when you read the papers that that are um, out there put on by the um, what's it called human rights groups, by the community advocates, it's laid out very obviously. We just want compassionate approaches to whatever system this is: migration, social welfare, banking, healthcare. So there's no there's no lack of imagination there, but it's just again will the system allow it to happen that's that's the main issue and this is where i think abolition is important um because again it's <laughs> and even without having to say abolition it's just the same thing it's it's pretty much compassionate it's, it's, it's about reinterpreting the system from something that punishes people to something that actually replenishes people's lives right so within migration for me yes one of the key things that i given the discussions that i've seen uh, given the 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 background especially looking at this um the what's it called the um recent the streaming algorithm that that was that got discontinued in 2020 um the home office streaming algorithm um to me yes banning the visa system is one as at least one point one bullet point of abolition and migration for me Right. And I think this is also because when, again, you look at the history of the visa requirement system, especially from like the 1940s, when you look at, you know, the ways that um, Trinidadian, Jamaicans, West Africans, we're all using a British passport up until they decided we'd rather punish these people and not let them come in than let them come in, you know, and try to integrate them into society. So. A lot of times when you look at, you know, the histories, again, you see that there were, there were much, sometimes there were some compassionate approaches, but then they got scrapped and got like changed into something that's entirely even more punitive than it was before. So yes, for me, abolition is very much about re reimagining the systems. It's about changing the systems. It's not about making better technology to, to, <laughs> to police people. It's about thinking of what are the other options instead of thinking of this migrant is is illegal, quote unquote, think of what systems or what, what are the um, difficulties that they had in their place of, in their, in their origins that sort of led them to, you know, move, um, to this other country. Right. So again, it's, it's taking a compassionate approach to, to whatever system it is that these technologies are being deployed in. Thank you so much. Um, same for me. I would not have ever thought that we would be talking about things like abolishing harmful systems um, in the context of technology. But I think with it, as you've mentioned, with any field, these are become, gonna become re relevant. And I really love your reflection of Irene about how can we move away from thinking about systems that police people and using technology to do that, but rather replenish them. Um, so with that, I would, it's a really beautiful way to end. And I would just like to thank you all so much for taking the time to share your thoughts and your expertise with us. Um, hopefully with this will be one of many uh, opportunities to talk about the topic of decolonizing data and also the many amazing pieces of work and resistance you guys are doing. Um, and also thank you very much to everybody that we can't see, but that is joining us and, and uh, listening in online. And thank you again to DFF for hosting and organizing us for this panel. And for that, we'll say goodbye. Thank you. <laughs>